And the pharmacist says, I've never seen anybody on so much fentanyl and still be alive. But I was taking 65 extra drinks like it in a day. Whoa. That's how out of control I got. So when we get back home, you can either take your pills or you can take your family. You choose. On September 17th, 2003, Kurt Angle was all set to face Brock Lesnar in a 60-minute Iron Man match on SmackDown for the WWE Championship. And out of nowhere, tragedy struck when he received the shocking news before the match that his sister had passed away from a heroin overdose. My brother calls me and says, hey, your sister just died of a heroin overdose. And it, it crushed me. WWE was trying to reach Angle to tell him to focus on those funeral arrangements, and they planned to go with something else, but Angle insisted on going through with the match. And for those 60 painful minutes, he wrestled Brock Lesnar, and he could be numb to everything else outside the ring, physically and obviously emotionally. Angle, on an interview with Joe Rogan Experience, said that at his peak, he popped 65 pills of Vicodin a day. Once I took that one painkiller, uh, your body builds a tolerance. And now it didn't work, so I had to take two. And then two went, ran into four, four ran into eight. I was taking 65 extra strength Viking in a day. That's, that could kill a horse. How did it even get to this point for Angle? One of the greatest wrestlers of all time, an Olympic gold medalist, ended up going to 12 different doctors to get 12 different prescriptions while hiding it from WWE and carried it into his years with TNA wrestling until four DUI arrests in five years made him go to rehab before he finally kicked out of this addiction. But he's only one of many stories in wrestling of wrestlers dealing with and succumbing to indirectly or directly the addiction that literally costs them their lives. Painkillers are arguably the biggest killer of all in professional wrestling. The greatest of the great have faced battles with this same problem. But before we get into the dark side of opioids in wrestling, we have to look at the very fundamentals of the human condition. For as long as humans have existed, we have felt pain, and for as long as humans have existed, they've sought remedies for this pain. Throughout the ages, painkillers slowly evolved from psychoactive plants like poppy seeds to herbal remedies to alcohol and eventually shaping into the opioids that we know today. Addictions have been around longer than we can recall as well as humanity has found itself in a constant cycle of seeking pleasure to escape pain in the common populace. It was in the 19th century when pharmacies began to recognize that the opportunity was there to supply opioids to the common populace. When the industry kicked off in the United States in the mid 1800s, it snowballed into something that's practically uncontrollable today. Opioids are now the biggest drug epidemic in American history. Overdoses have claimed half a million lives since 1999. As pharmaceutical companies grew rapidly over the century with growing demands during times of war, they expanded even more during times of peace, largely in part due to their influence in the government and seemingly free reign to falsely market and promote the safety of their drugs. There was a growing financial incentive, not just for pharmaceutical executives, but even for your average mom and pop doctor to recommend things like painkillers. In the 1980s, opioids were recommended as a safe way to treat pain. And you can guess the wrestling boom period matched up with this. This was the 1980s. Kurt Angle's detailed account of his painkiller addiction got us thinking, what is the reason behind the prevalent use of painkillers in pro wrestling? Has the use of it reduced? And why are wrestlers so prone to taking them? There's been a lot of talk for decades about the use of steroids in pro wrestling, something that was commonplace until the 1990s. But legends like Bret Hart have been outspoken since the 90s, with the hitman claiming that marijuana use, which was banned at the time, was considerably safer alternative than what wrestlers were using to mask their pain with opioids. We'll get to marijuana usage later, but let's get to why painkillers became the thing. As you may know, pro wrestlers, especially in WWE, are on the road for at least around 300 days a year. Apart from the emotional sacrifice of having to miss that time with your family and friends, birthdays, vacations, and more, it's the physical pain that they endure throughout all of the stress of the travel. Back in the day, wrestling through pain and injuries came down to one thing. Nobody wanted to lose their spot. 
If a specific wrestler was in a strong position on the card of the promotion they were in, getting pushed, taking time off for an injury meant that another wrestler would get their spot. Before there were downside guaranteed contracts for most wrestlers in a major promotion, it possibly meant losing out on hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in the future if you weren't able to deal with the pain. And that's the only televised part of it. Most of these matches for the wrestling period in that time were live events, house shows, not in front of fans watching around the world. And the ultra strenuous lifestyle of wrestlers made them prime targets for pain management prescriptions. WWE Hall of Famer Jake the Snake was another man who lived to tell the tale. And he blamed the uptick in painkiller use on a WWE decision to ban the use of pot. The decision to ban pot from superstars living that demanding life on the road was considered a weed tax of $2,500 from their salary, and it no longer exists. But according to Jake Roberts, McMahon's call led to wrestlers relying on alcohol and pills more than weed. Without a go-to thing to relax and come down from the demands of a pro wrestling match, WWE stars doubled down on beers and then began to use different kinds of pills. It got worse when they began taking alcohol and pills together. The late great big man Terry Gordon had an incident in 1993 where he took reported 15 pain pills and suffered an overdose on a flight leaving from Japan, which put him in a comatose state. Although he survived, he suffered permanent damage leading up to his death, unfortunately, seven years later. Jake Roberts called his addiction to painkillers flying into the fire, stating that you can't just walk away from the skillet. A lesser known victim of painkiller addiction is legendary Rey Mysterio. The greatest luchador in WWE history revealed on the Impulsive podcast that his wife, Angie, caught him, quote, out of it during a vacation in 2008. She gave him an ultimatum. When they went home, he would either have to choose pills or choose his family. When we get back home, you can either take your pills or you can take your family. You choose. When he flew to the next TV taping for WWE, he told Vince McMahon that he needed to check himself into rehab, a decision that his boss respected and even praised. It helped give him a new perspective on life, and although he never mentioned it, Eddie Guerrero's years of drug abuse may have had a big impact on Mysterio. The two of them were very close friends and on-screen rivals. One of the most popular pro wrestlers of all time, Hulk Hogan, he too has gripped with addiction and is representative of the fact that during a career when wrestlers resort to pills, it's not something that ends as an addiction during your career, but may even continue on after it. Having had a staggering 25 surgeries on his body, the face of WWE's rock and wrestling era revealed that he had been prescribed painkillers and relied on them because he was getting operated on almost every four months, reaching a point where he could barely function. The thing that shut me down completely where I said enough's enough is when they hit me with the fentanyl stuff. Mm. They almost killed me with that stuff. So that's when I said, I'm done. He credited CBD as a safer alternative that got him off the hook. Carlito returned to WWE recently after being away from the company for 13 years, but many have either forgotten or are unaware of the fact that he was released in 2010 not because of marijuana or cocaine use, but his addiction to painkillers. He had just violated the WWE wellness policy and was asked to check himself into rehab after appearing at a TV taping in an unfit condition. Refusing to do so, WWE cut their losses, after which his father, the legendary Hall of Famer Carlos Colon Sr., confirmed that his painkiller use had turned into an abusive state. For him, his backstabber with knees was the finisher that proved that it could be wear and tear. And as it turned out, having the weight of a two or 300 pound man on your knees isn't good for your back either. Although Carlito was upset about his father making that statement without his consent, he admitted that the painkiller use was also to mask his depression. Even Brock Lesnar, painkiller abuse was something that spelled the end of his first run in WWE, albeit on his own terms. Being the hottest young star in the business at the time, getting a rocket strapped to his back from the get-go, it seemed inevitable that Lesnar was going to suffer a lot of wear and tear. And that wear and tear included broken ribs, torn 
torn out knees and elbows, which according to Lesnar led to him taking a lot of Vicodin and vodka. And it didn't take him long to get burned out from the intense schedule, and he had only been on the main roster for two years. Lesnar, seeing the writing on the wall that other stars who had gone through the same thing that had been going on for decades, he decided to call it quits with WWE and only return to the company on a part-time contract, though he did continue to wrestle and eventually had success in UFC. It's clear that from just these few examples of survivors taking painkillers, it has become inevitably a part of their lifestyle, whether they like it or not. The pain became too much to bear, and with no safe alternative option and the ruthless nature of the wrestling business naturally, they resort to pills to mask their physical and emotional pain. And it isn't easy to just stop the usage at that level. Withdrawal is possibly the biggest struggle of the entire issue, and with early symptoms including insomnia, anxiety, muscle aches, which later symptoms include nausea, abdominal cramping, and even diarrhea. It's just, it's not easy to get off pain pills. We haven't even brought up the taboo that existed in admitting that one's addiction and the lack of resources available to help them. In a world as tough and as machismo driven as pro wrestling, everybody, and we mean everybody, was hiding their pain constantly. While this video itself is about painkiller addiction within pro wrestling, let it shed a light on the overall worldwide opioid addiction crisis. Even back in 2019, the World Health Organization reported that 80% of substance abuse deaths are related to opioids, with 25% of those deaths directly caused by opioid overdoses. Sure, the proportion of painkiller use has been a lot higher among pro wrestlers and other athletes, but it's not an exclusive issue, it's a worldwide one. In terms of pro wrestlers themselves, the list of names that have passed away due to painkiller related issues requires an entire video separate to itself, sadly. Names like Eddie Guerrero, Omaga, Rick Rude, Sherry Martel, Davey Boy Smith, Test, China, Terry Gordy, and countless other painkiller related deaths from happening. This is obviously a lot easier said than done, but proper medical supervision and more transparency in drug marketing and prescriptions is a start. As a viewer, you might be asking yourself what you could do on a personal level to prevent someone from having issues like this. For one, we'd suggest becoming more educated and even critical of medications and seeking multiple opinions when prescribed potent drugs. If you're someone who struggles with pain and addiction, you might find a lot of previously mentioned incidents from wrestlers highly relatable. Just remember to listen to legends like Kurt Angle who have been to hell and came back when they tell you how easy it is to fall into this very, very dangerous cycle, even with seemingly inevitably early deaths approaching because of this problem. While WWE can't change the nature of the pharmaceutical industry in the United States or worldwide, they can change the wrestling industry, and to a great degree, they have. Starting a few months after Eddie Guerrero's tragic passing in November of 2005, WWE introduced the wellness policy program and has cracked down a lot more on pill usage, and it's evolved as the times have changed. Even in the way that WWE handles concussions, they've gotten a lot better and there isn't too much of a tabu as they're used to be when dealing with addiction issues. This isn't to say that wrestlers have stopped taking painkillers altogether. Carlito said back in 2010 that most wrestlers were taking them, but the overall number of victims who succumbed to that addiction has certainly decreased over the years. Pro wrestling superstars still compete through that pain and still avoid losing those major spots. But in terms of the physical and mental health of wrestlers, there hasn't been a better time than the era we're currently in. And it's easy for people to look from the outside and judge these pro wrestlers for easily falling into a cycle of addiction. But the truth is that most of us would have possibly resorted to the same thing if we were in that position. It's just the reality of how much pain you have to endure to go through this business at this level. Just remember, from time to time, when you're watching your favorite wrestlers, it isn't an easy lifestyle. And the levels of painkiller addiction are just a reflection of a much larger global problem that didn't start in pro wrestling. We've provided a few resources in the links below for opioid addiction. So check them out, and if you feel the need to, reach out. As always, Thanks for watching, stay healthy, and don't forget to check out some other videos we have here at Sports Key to Wrestling.